Okay, I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv. We're covering Intel Developer Forum 2012. It's a mobile cube, and we're here with Cube alumni, Pauline Nist. Welcome to the mobile cube. Um, first, you have a new role at Intel. Um, we're here in San Francisco where it's, it's, it's geek heaven. Alpha geeks are all here. You're an alpha geek, software.intel.com. So share with us, one, what's happening at IDF here and your new role. Well, I think here at IDF, uh, we're talking about all our new technology. Uh, we'll be talking about servers a little bit more than Dottie did this morning in his one slide. Uh, but lots of new client stuff, as you saw this morning, in a, a keynote that was really focused on showing you how to use it rather than speeds and feeds. Um, what I'm doing is I've been in the data center group all of this time, and we in the data center group have realized that software is becoming more and more important, whether it's software-defined networks or whether it's the software-defined data center. So we've got a new group now, which is the data center software Vision, and it sits with a dual reporting relationship to Diane Bryant on the, the data center side and to Renee James on the software and services side uh, with a goal of bringing more focus across the board to software for the data center, software as a business in the data center, and what Intel can do there going forward. Intel is no stranger to the notion of abstract pool and automate, which is the theme we heard at VMworld uh, this year. Um, and you guys have done that with processors and with silicon abstracting away. But we heard um, this morning that it's not about just silicon anymore, it's about the solutions. So talk about your definition of this software-led infrastructure. Because it's not just servers anymore, it's storage, it's networking. We saw VMware buy Nasir for a billion dollars. The startup community is active with uh, really high-end engineering and some great stuff going on. So, so tell us your definition of software-led infrastructure. Well, I think software-led infrastructure takes advantage of the fact that we've got Xeons everywhere now. We've got them, you know, in 80% of the storage market. They're moving into the network market with the fabric work that we're doing, obviously on the server side. And what you realize is when you have one IA infrastructure everywhere, you can really do everything in software now. It's, you know, a common platform that lets you do software-defined networking, that lets you do open storage, that lets you do open stack for the cloud. And that all of that is really going to just be the software that you run on a standard platform that gives you total flexibility. Um, and in the long term, if you really got to the point where all of this was software defined, think about the flexibility you'd have moving resources around. Because a Xeon server is a Xeon server is a Xeon server, and what you choose to load, expand, contract your resource pool with gives you the ultimate flexibility. So we're, you know, we're living in a world now where people see Apple, and that's kind of a closed architecture with their view, and but open uh, center, data, data center alliance you guys are involved in, and Android's much more open. Um, what do people don't understand around this notion of software inside the data center? I mean, because it's a little bit different paradigm, because it's not a monolithic infrastructure anymore. You've got modular data centers, you've got you know, power and cooling issues, you have all kinds of automation challenges. What's what is the big thing people need to know about around this new era of software infrastructure? Well, I think the biggest thing about this new era of software infrastructure is a real strong commitment to open. Uh, because we've had proprietary solutions that are out there and we have vendors today that would like to perpetrate the proprietary solutions going forward. And we think that to get to a truly elastic kind of automated cloud environment that you need to have a set of open standards that are fundamental to the base of it that can be implemented by a variety of vendors but still give you the choice of whose solutions you would pick and choose at various tiers of that. Because, for instance, you might choose one vendor for virtualization, you might choose another one for open storage. Um, there might be areas in which you'd like to see an open appliance and those will exist too but choice I think is the big word and one of the big fears that data center people have got is that if um, if there isn't really a serious er uh, effort to keep it open that there will still be proprietary stacks that try to dominate large portions of, of a cloud infrastructure going forward. What are some of the fears and what are some of the new trends that are, are happening around this, the software movement? Because we know HP, we know Dell, we know a lot of the, the server vendors. Uh, we know about Cisco, we see Nasir coming on screen, we see Arista doing some good things with J3, it's on theCUBE. So you have all the classic hardware folks who now are embracing cloud and mobility in real time and stuff. We've talked about Hadoop. What is the, what are the, what's the main fear you're seeing and what do they need to get over to make software become a big part of that infrastructure? Well, I think the, the big word is where they're going to monetize. Because all of those traditional vendors, whether they're Cisco or HP, have had areas where they've had some amount of exclusivity in offering you a platform or, or software for management tools or software for databases or for virtualization. And as they move forward, um, they like to subscribe to this notion of open, but then the question is, how do I make money at open? And you know, you've got Red Hat out there as the only pure open play that's actually definitively shown that they can be profitable. 
profitable, I think there's a, there's a lot of concern right now. I mean, I think that VMware with their acquisition of Nicera, everybody's playing nice now, but as I said to people, the honeymoon's always good. The question is what it looks like a year or two down the line in terms of where VMware continues to want to carve out where it can add value. You know, is, is management uh, of, of a heterogeneous cloud environment going to be enough? Is that really going to work from the base they have today to moving forward? And I think everybody, everybody that's got a proprietary contribution today is in that same game. Cisco for sure. Obviously the database guys, I mean, you know, they've they've clearly got vertical stacks that they would like to keep you committed to. So, you know, so, software, it's just bits, you know, whether they're open, how accessible they are, what they cost is the real issue. Yeah, we'll always keep keeping an eye on that. Uh, we've got Oracle Open World coming oh, yeah. up, so we'll... It's your busy time of year. You, I, I expect to see you once a month from now on Christmas. <laughs> we love it. Oh, Oracle Open World is one of my favorites. You know, everyone's standing there worried, scared at the same time, smiling. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the enterprise, because the cloud has changed the game a lot. Public cloud disrupted the startup scene. Now, hybrid and pub private cloud are allowing enterprise to be more efficient. Um, but with Flash and with Hadoop and big data, that migration has not happened fast enough because economics and performance are happening back into the enterprise, right? right. So I want to ask you specifically around the environment, the personnel packages we're seeing. What are you seeing inside the IT data center what roles in particular? What roles are emerging and what roles aren't yet invented and what roles are kind of sliding down? Well, the enterprise is always going to be a huge mix because, you know, it's. Uh, I think it's the COBOL programmers that have finally retired now, but don't get me wrong, the DBAs are going to be around for a while. I don't think you're going to be, you know, collecting uh, government food stamps uh, as a DBA for my lifetime. But the flip side of that that is, I think that if you look at where enterprises are hiring, it is all in this cloud era. I mean, whether it's it's setting up your own infrastructure for private cloud or whether it's being smart enough to buy it from somebody. Because if you want to outsource your cloud services from somebody, you got to be smart enough to write the contract, the right SLAs. I mean, I laugh every time. I mean, GoDaddy was down for, what, six hours yesterday. you got to pay attention when you cloud outsource. Are you buying at the bottom of the pile or are you buying in the middle of the pile or are you buying an SLA that says, this is really important to my business? Because all three of those offerings exist today and likewise if you set it up internally um, you want some people who know cloud and know how to put those stacks together and know how to put those tools together and a lot of them are open today and you can source them from anywhere but you also want to have them sit down in a room with your mission critical people and figure out how you keep it up and how you do service level agreements and how you actually deliver guaranteed service because you can do that uh, you can't throw away the old knowledge you have just for the new I, you know there's a lot of a lot of people who'd like to believe that but uh, you'd like to think there's some carry over there. What do you think about security in particular? Because we had a talk on the, um, the Cube about security and, and this, the cloud is obviously creating kind of this little cold war thing going on. People are kind of smiling at each other but thinking what, how are they going to get over on me. Um, but then you got security. Security speaks to SLA. You talked about GoDaddy. Oh, yeah. Security is table stakes. Uh, is it a do-over or we have to reinvent that? What, what do you see for that future? Um, I think that there are a lot of people today who are brute forcing it and just saying simple things like Larry did at Oracle Open World last year, like I'm not supporting multiple tenancy. If I can't guarantee it, I'm not going to do it. That doesn't mean I can't get a lot of economics out of the cloud. It can't, doesn't mean I can't do standard configurations. I can't do automation. Um, it just puts some parameters around it. I think people would like to get past those because that's where you get the real efficiency and the real scalability. But true security in a multi-tenant cloud environment, we got ways to go to deliver those products. They're not out there yet. Um, and it's going to be a combination because, you know, you, you could spend the whole day talking about security of everything from the encryption side of it to the access control side of it. And um, we've got a lot of presentations on how to deliver it, but that doesn't mean we're delivering it today and nobody is, quite frankly. And so I think you will see people do what they can because there's lots of advantage to be gained. I mean, I uh, I was just reading uh, one of the analysts put out a, a paper on um, how much you could save doing software as a service from your ISV versus deploying an on-premise piece of hardware. You know, it's something like 57%. So, I mean, even if you're if you're buying it on a non a multi-tenant environment, you're still saving a heck of a lot of money going to that more efficient environment where you're managing a whole site for power, for cooling, for standardized configurations, for you know performance monitoring for automation tools, that's still a huge win. 
Pauline, tell us on final question here. Tell us about your message to partners of Intel. I see software with Renee, and you got data center. You guys clear leadership in both areas. What's your message to service your uh, your partners around this software infrastructure and big data and mobility? What do they need to know about going forward? Well, I think it can be summed up in Diane changing the name of the organization over a year ago. I guess right when she and Kirk changed jobs to a data center group because it is all the components now. You heard Dottie talk about the fact that we've done these fabric acquisitions. So we start with the chips. We we go through fabrics, we go through storage, we go through networking. We no longer see ourselves as a component provider, we see ourselves as a data center provider. And as you've mentioned, a lot of that is moving to software definitions for that. So we can't run away from software anymore. I mean, it's intrinsic to delivering to the ecosystem we want, and we need those partners. We need uh, the guys who do standards, the guys who do solutions, the guys who do management tools to work with us, because even as we put this stuff together, we can't supply all of it, and you're going to see us continue to be real strong players in the open community because we think that's that's key to moving forward. We're with Pauline Nisk, Cube alumni, new role driving the software-led infrastructure at Intel. I'll see Intel's got the hand on the pulse. I'm John Furrier, SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, coverage of IDF 2012. We'll be right back with our next guests.